Okay, we are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome uh, to the program Ellie Mistal. He is the Nation's uh, Magazine's Justice Correspondent and the Alfred Nobler Fellow at Type at the Type Media Center. Uh, Ellie, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for not making me uh, go outside in this uh, p- global pandemic crisis. Uh, my, and- my, my pleasure. Um, now, uh, so you, re- you wrote a piece in the Nature magazine. Uh, I was just talking about how uh, the uh, time has, um, the, the pace of things has moved quite quickly. Um, and you wrote a piece about the, uh, you know, uh, I guess on some level imagining, uh, starting with the premise that even if the Democrats were to take uh, the House and the Senate and the presidency, even in overwhelming fashion, uh, in November, which um, and you and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, the 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 chance of having an election in November uh, in a minute. But let's presume that there's going to be. And I think it's uh, let's presume that the Democrats um, win the presidency and also take back the Senate. Um, uh, from your perspective, it'll be all for naught because of the Supreme Court. Yeah, I think it's uh, look, I've, I've been I've been on this soapbox for a while here. There are three branches of government, and most of the media only focuses on the first two. You know, Congress and the president get all of the coverage. The third branch, the Supreme Court, um, doesn't get as much coverage and isn't covered politically, and it should be, because the Supreme Court has turned itself into an entirely politicized body. If you didn't get it, you know, when, uh, uh, tr- when, when, when McConnell blocked Merrick Garland simply because Garland was nominated by Democratic president, you surely should have got, gotten it when Trump nom- nominated Brett Kavanaugh and pushed forward an arch conservative with alleged attempted rape allegations hanging over him just because he would be a solid vote for Trump's agenda. Um, given how the court has been manipulated towards the Republican advantage, it is – Inconscionable to me that you're a Democrat candidate running for president with all of these like grand ideas and plans, and yet don't have a plan to deal with the fact that the Supreme Court is going to knock you down. Um, anything that the Democrats want to do on climate change, um, anything that the Democrats want to do on gun control, anything that the Democrats want to do on health care will be stymied by John Roberts and his four conservative buddies on the Supreme Court. Um, and so we have to think, I think, uh, very critically and very deeply about ways to reform the Supreme Court. Um, you know, court right, well, hacking. Before we get there, I want I want to get to that in a bit. But but I mean, let's just stop for a moment and uh, mar- uh, marinate on the fact that the two candidates that we have now in the race seem to be, um, in some respects, the least inclined to um, to reform. The, the court in any structural fashion. Um, in, in fact, um, Biden's surrogate, Chris Coons, has said publicly, if we take back the Senate, meaning the Democrats, he wants to reinstitute the filibuster on judges for I mean, it's- for the Republicans. I mean, uh, and, 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 and Sanders seems to be, you know, a little bit of an institutionalist in this respect. He hasn't come out with either a filibuster reform or uh, a, a, a plan for the Supreme Court. Um, Pete Buttigieg was the only one who seemed to have any type of like uh, a plan. He sort of abandoned it um, uh, when he, he made his turn to the right. But let's talk about the Buttigieg plan, because um, it was, I think, there was something similar. He adopted part of it from Matt Ford, I believe. And I can't remember where he wrote, but uh, I, I think we spoke to him about that about a year and a half ago. Yeah, Buttigieg's plan was, you know, was an interesting way of going about it. Um, basically, uh, for without getting too much into the legal weeds, he wants to have he wanted to have five, you know, avowed liberal justices, five avowed conservative justices, and five judges in the middle, moderates he called them, um, who would kind of work to balance the court. Um, there are lots of constitutional questions about that. Um, there are a lot of political questions about that, um, but in in spirit, it was it was an ag- it was an aggressive idea to reform 
how the Supreme Court operates at a fundamental level. Buttigieg, I think to his credit, was particularly concerned about this issue on the campaign trail, again, before he went you know, right wing. Right. Um, he was very consistent about how his own marriage is only made possible by one vote on the Supreme Court. And because of that personal experience, he was arguing that he had a particular, you know, understanding and appreciation for how deeply important the Supreme Court is to our system of laws and to our politics as well. Um, so well, let's, just, go, let's, play- let's go into the weeds a little bit about it because, um, because we're all locked in our homes. Um, but, nah. uh, but, but honestly, well, I wrote like, 5,000 words. Well, There's yes. That. I mean, let's, yeah. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's just talk a little bit about how one would achieve that. And, and, you know, one of the problems, I mean, Aside from all the complications in, you know, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the legal questions, and I think, you know, when we examine his plan, it'll, it'll bring up some other sort of obstacles to reform or issues in terms of reform. But, but just on like a non, uh, from, a, from a non-structural standpoint, it's also sort of hard to, obs- to assess, you know, who's liberal, who's moderate, and who's conservative on some level, right? I mean— it's- Absolutely, Sam, and it's one of the ways that I feel like the media has generally failed us um, when it comes to covering the Supreme Court. We think, you know, people are told that there are moderate judges out there, judges who are not political, who stay above the politics of the day and just focus on the law, and that's just not true. That's just not how the law works. That's just not how judicial decision making works. You can find a judge who is moderate on some areas of the law who's actually an extremist on other areas of the law. And the example that I used in my article is, is the kind of key one, Anthony Kennedy, former Justice Anthony Kennedy, who was called a moderate because he occasionally broke from the Republican orthodoxy on issues of rights, especially gay rights. And so that made people think that Kennedy was some kind of moderate and kind of standard bearer. In fact... While, yes, he did believe in, in, in strong in, in and in a more equal uh, version of, of civil rights, especially when it comes to the gay and lesbian community, he got there because he happens to be an extremist when it comes to the First Amendment. Kennedy was a First Amendment absolutist. He's, Kennedy is the guy who wrote Citizens United, which is currently destroying our political culture, right? Um, that that's an example of Kennedy's extremism on one issue of the law that has sweeping effects on our entire system. That is not a moderate – his position in Citizens United was not a moderate opinion. Kennedy was no moderate when it came to the First Amendment. He was willing to go with – he was not an ideologue in the way that, like, uh, Brett Kavanaugh or Sam Alito are. But he was no, no moderate, and that's part of our, our that's part of the way that we need to reform our thinking about the Supreme Courts and and what judges do in general. There is no moderation really. There are people who believe certain things about the law, and and there and, and there are people who are more kind of willing to push their agenda and their ideology into every case, and there are people who are more willing to kind of take things on a case-by-case basis um, and kind of adjudicate uh, cases that way. That's really the distinction. It's a case-by-case versus ideological, ideologically driven understanding, more, less than you know, a liberal conservative moderation point. Right, and we should also say, too, that the, you know, the, the, one of the things that escapes this is just sort of like, um, you know, the, and, and I think this is, you know, the, the right seems to have been able to define those terms in terms of liberal, conservative, and moderate in the context of largely, it seems to me, um, the areas of, of like, the culture war, uh, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe in criminal justice as well, um, and civil right, you know, civil rights and civil liberties. But there's a whole body of decisions that are made about corporations that get absolutely no scrutiny whatsoever. And I, you know, I just remember back uh, listening to Pam Carlin, uh, I don't know, about uh, 10 years ago speak, saying that you know, we have not put a, uh, there's been no justice who has been replaced, replaced by someone to the left of them in decades. 
uh, on the, uh, on a whole host of these issues. There, there, there are two things at play, right? One is the general rightward lurching of the Supreme Court in our lifetimes. I'm 41 years old, and, and, and Pam Carlin is exactly right. There has not in my life has a justice been replaced by a more liberal version of themselves. Um, since I, well, I guess maybe, maybe that's not true. Maybe Souter was, you know, replacing Sotomayor with Souter. That's probably a leftward uh, tilt. But other than that, there really hasn't been, right? And the reason for that is that the Republicans, and especially through their kind of judiciary enforcement club, uh, the Federalist Society, have been so effective at winning the argument, okay? Um, they, the Federalist Society is basically a marketing strategy in search of a legal ideology, right? Their marketing strategy is what people have called originalism, some kind of belief that um, the Constitution should be interpreted whenever possible in the ways that the people who wrote the document would have understood the the laws and the terms at the time, right? And that's why you have originalists like Neil Gorsuch, who is basically like, you know, reading the Canterbury Tales every time he's trying to figure out which way he's, what would the wife of Bath have done, is basically Neil Gorsuch's judicial philosophy, right? Um, it's, it's, it works because it's, it, first of all, it, it fits on a bumper sticker, right? right? It sounds reasonable. But what originalism really is, it's all about locking in the interpretation of the law back in a time before black people vote to vote, before women could vote, before gay people had rights at all. Um, it's locking in a version of the law in a, in a kind of old school white supremacist way, white patriarchy way, um, that most people have, you know, most of the country are against. Like, if you actually poll people and you ask them, should we think of the law or the terms of the law in the way that we modernly understand these terms or in, in the way that they understood them in the 18th century, most people will say, well, we should have a modern interpretation. But they've won the kind of marketing argument around originalism. And, and, two, and I would argue, too, but, just to add on that point, is that I'm not even convinced that it's really, like, it's it's really more of, like, this guy's, and it's a guy, uh, this guy's projection of what they thought, in his, you know, both, it, it, you know, sort of like tainted by his own uh, 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 sort of um, uh, sense of, 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 of white supremacy, frankly, uh, white male supremacy, it, it, projecting it onto them. Because in, in, exactly. in many instances, that's the, not even the, the case either. society acts like it has like a Ouija board. Right. That it's able to use to contact James Madison every time they have a question. Um, that's just not true. And just to just to emphasize the point of how um, I was going to use a bad word, um, just how disingenuous the um, the originalism argument is. Um, the most famous originalism decision of our lifetime is as Ant Antonin Scalia's opinion in D.C. versus Heller, that's the yep. big gun case that eviscerated kind of gun reform and gun control laws throughout the country. It is in that case that Mr. Originalism himself invented a new gun right. The, the, the right to hold a gun for personal self-protection was never said in the Constitution, was never said in the lead-up to the Constitution, was never said in any of the kind of doc – there's no documentary evidence that that is what – Jefferson and Madison and Hamilton were thinking about when they wrote the Second Amendment. Scalia invented that right in 2000, you know, in the 2000s, saying, oh, well, if they were alive today, they would surely understand this as, a, you know, as a right to, uh, to own a gun for personal self-defense. So originalists will invent new rights when it suits them. Right. They just have a nice marketing strategy around it. So the Federal Society has but, – but, again, the, the, the key issue here is that the Federal Society has won this kind of marketing debate, and it's been able to get basically all of their Republican judges on the same line, on the same kind of groupthink party-line decision, so that to advance in Republican jurisprudence, right, to, to get the job – as the clerk for the for for the high ranking judge to get the appointment to the district court to the lower court um whatever to get the invitation to speak in front of the people that will promote your career you have to accept this doctrine the liberals have no no comparable 
uh, uh, doctrine. And quite and no, frankly, as much as sometimes people say, like, oh, maybe we should, like, no, like, part of being a liberal is that we don't believe that there should be some one all encompassing ideology or doctrine that can be shoehorned into every single case that we have. Um, uh, I think it was Learned Hand, right, who said, um, uh, being liberal means you're not quite sure if you're right uh, in the context of, of, of the Supreme Court. I, th- I believe it was him. Um, but I would also add that, you know, to the extent that the, um, the left, uh, as it were, has attempted to create its own organization, that would be the ACS, the American Constitution Society. And in, in many respects, because people on the left, i.e. Democrats, have not gotten with the program, that became, in some ways, almost a liability because the right would target these people and knock them down when they came up for nomination. And there was not enough. I mean, there is also, I mean, putting aside the sort of the, the superior marketing, it seems to me that on the left, and I know, I, 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 you know, you're probably the last person maybe in the world I need to tell this to, but there is a uh, severe... Um, lack of appreciation of the importance of, I mean, that's why he wrote the piece. That's why, I mean, but there, there, it's just a severe lack of appreciation on the left for the role of the court in our society and all the courts. I mean, not, not just Supreme court, but like, you know, the DC circuit court. There's an, there's an asymmetrical war of the left fights um, on the courts. And the reason why is that the Republic, and this is going to be my second point here. So the federal society has won the marketing argument, but the Republican politicians for a generation have done an excellent job of explaining to their voters why the Supreme Court is important. Okay? So it's not that look, it's not that some Republican voter in Iowa is any more like legally, you know, aware than a Democratic voter in Florida. That's not what it is. The difference is that the Republican candidate in Iowa tells his voters, hey, the reason why I can or cannot do this is because of judges, right? And it's, and it's, and it's raw and it's disgusting, but they do it all the time. You know, you don't like them men kissing? Well, it's the Supreme Court's fault. You don't like that woman who seems to have control over her own body? That's the Supreme Court's fault. That they, they tell their voters directly that the Supreme Court is why they can't have nice things. Liberals, on the other hand, especially our, our elected officials, do not tell our voters how important the Supreme Court is. So when bad things happen, and you brought this up and it's so important, um, the John Roberts Court has been the most pro-business court in American history by far. And it was before he got a Republican majority. All right, the, the Roberts Court will go down in history as the most pro-business court ever in American history, and most Democrats do not know that because most Democratic politicians have not told their voters why these things are happening. Right? So when we talk, and I'm not slamming Bernie here, but when we talk about millionaires and billionaires and all of the we, – we don't make that second-level – connection of like the reason millionaires and billionaires have been able to dominate the system is because of the Supreme Court. Yeah, and like we don't make that second level connection to our voters to get them motivated and kind of on the ground ready to vote for Democrats, not because they agree with policy X or policy Y, but because they know that the Democrat will nominate judges that, that are good. I mean, I, I, I share your frustration. I mean, I feel like um, Sanders does not articulate this, I think, uh, to a certain extent because of his, um, I think, you know, democratic socialism um, does not engage or, or does not engage with some of the sort of the structural, I think, realities of of the American government. On the other hand, uh, Joe Biden is uh, not saying anything because, frankly, I think that he uh, and his ilk appreciate not having to litigate these things publicly. They're happy where it lands. I mean, that that seems to me to be the dilemma that we have, is that uh, to the extent that the, there is a left in the Democratic Party that has a problem with these decisions, they do not uh, focus on the structural issues that are there. Um, and to the extent that we have uh, another part of the Democratic Party, they are, you know, they're like, well... The referee said we can't do it, so we can't do it. Or the referee made this call, and so, you know, what can we do? 
And I, I'm not convinced that that's not convenient for them. I mean, why else would Chris Coons get out there and say, we need to reinstitute the, the filibuster if the Republicans, if, if we take power? I mean, that's just absurd. I think there are two issues in play that Biden is, is the, at the center of two failures in the Democratic Party here on, on this issue. Um, one is the longstanding reluctance of Democratic elected officials, male Democratic elected offici- officials, to fight the abortion fight in the trenches. Right? They are still of a time, people like Biden are still of a time where they thought the right answer was that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. It, I mean, and when I say of a time, that's also what last nominee's vice president, um, Tim, uh, vice presidential nominee Tim Kaine yeah. used to say, safe, legal, and rare, right? They don't want to fight the abortion issue. The Supreme Court makes you fight the abortion issue, and so they're afraid of running on the Supreme Court because they're afraid of having the abortion issue front and center, and it's one of the reasons why we have lost the abortion issue, you know, why, why we're on a, lose, a 20-year losing streak on a woman's right to choose. Women Democrats are willing to fight it. You know, Cecile Richards will be will, will, will be the first woman to stand a post if it needs to be fought for, right? But male Democratic leaders are not willing to fight this issue in the way that it needs to be fought, and that devolves into a weakness when it comes to the Supreme Court. That's number one. Number two, people like Biden are 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 desperate for a return to normal, a return to institutionalism, and that also means a return to a depoliticized um, Supreme Court. That is one of the problems that I have had in the past with the American Constitution Society, the ACS, the Federal Society, you know, uh, a liberal version of it that you mentioned earlier. Um, now they have a new leader, Russ Feingold, former Senator Russ Feingold. He might change that organization quite a bit. But previously, the ACS has been an organization kind of committed to depoliticizing the courts. That's not what the Fed Sock does. The Fed Sock politicizes the hell out of it and wins, right? Um, the Democrats have been unwilling to understand that the courts have been politicized, and so we need to fight for them with the political tools available to us, right? Biden doesn't want to do that. Quite frankly, and, you know, love the guy, have a picture of him on my wall, but Obama wasn't either. Obama was fundamentally a Supreme Court depoliticized institutionalist, um, and he approached his Supreme Court appointments in very much that way, the kind of reserved, slow. Look at, look at the difference Merrick between Garland. Obama's speed of appointments versus Trump's, right? That's all Trump and McConnell want to do is appoint judges. Obama was considered, they vetted them very deeply, they made sure they were credentialed, and blah, 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 blah. But Trump is just like, hey, you Republican, come on down. You can be on a court. Um, the, the, the Republicans have been willing to politicize the court. The Democrats have tried to depoliticize the courts. That is why the Democrats are losing the political battle for the courts. Um, the, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. One, we should say that uh, uh, Brian Fallon, a, a former Obama official, has set up basically a, um, uh, an organization that is, you know, developing the lists that, um, you know, the, the demand, equivalent lists. Demand justice. I love those yes. guys. I've, I've been to a couple of talks with, with them. Fallon, Fallon gets it. Having been through the Obama administration, having worked for Hillary Clinton on her campaign, Fallon gets how and why we've lost the courts. And I feel like his organization, Demand Justice, is, is the group that is trying to fight fire with fire. Now, they're not as well funded as the Fed Sock. That's something else we haven't talked about. The Fed Sock is 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 well funded by the Koch brothers, by the Mercer families. You name me a rich Republican donor, and I will promise you that he has donated large sums of money to the Federal Society. The Federal Society is one of the most is one of the best funded political action organizations in the country. Liberals have no kind of counterpart because our liberal our liberal billionaires when they have their money they run for president with it well and (laughs) and on top of that i i think frankly they're not too displeased with the way the court operates right i mean that's your that's your point about how a lot of these people they're happy where it lands right exactly mike bloomberg can go out talking about stopping the most pro-business court in, 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 in American history, why would you agree with me? Right, exactly. And 